How many of you remember two weeks ago when we were last gathered together in this room, we all wore orange and blue and we waved orange pom-poms and we took a picture to send to Seattle? Well, the best part of Super Bowl Sunday was the opera singer who sang the national anthem, Renee Fleming. So in that spirit, we give thanks today for Greg Palmer, for Opera Colorado, for the opera singers who will uh, regale us shortly, and a couple of uh, words of gratitude for great operas that have shaped our life long before Super Bowls came along and will be here long after, Madam Butterfly, uh, Aida, Carmen, Marriage of Figaro, Barbara Seville, and is it Rigolato you guys are doing soon? Okay. Let us pray and give thanks. God, thank you for the gift of music, for opera music. We remember the words of Puccini who wrote, the music of this opera, Madame Butterfly, was de dictated to me by God. I was merely the instrument in putting it on paper and communicating it to the public. Thank you again for all your good gifts to us of food, of service, of music, and community. Amen. Thank you very much. My, uh, please remember, we're going to sit down just a second for lunch. February is World Understanding Month, and that's important within Rotary. And if I might um, st st uh, end the, this section, and then we'll sit down and have lunch. I'd like to also give you a little thought about opera. This came from George Bernard Shaw. He said, opera is when a tenor and soprano want to make love, but are prevented from doing so by the baritone. <laughs> we will see you in 10 minutes. <laughs> Juan tells a fascinating story about being one of the first people in America to be inoculated against polio. And so when you have an opportunity to visit with him, ask him about that. It's incredible. Juan was born in Lima, Peru, to the, a general of the Peruvian army, lived in Peru for much of his life, as well as here in Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, he married uh, the lovely Anita. He studied at the Universidad Nacional de Ingeniera, from 1960 to 1965 in Lima, graduating with honors as a mechanical and electrical engineer. He was then sent by Occidental to the United States for a master's in human resources at AMA. He served as a project engineer in Peru, eventually becoming the head of human resources as the director in, uh, for Occidental Petroleum in Lima. Uh, upon leaving Occidental, uh, Juan started an IT company in Peru and since has moved here to the United States to be close to his two sons with whom he has established an automobile business. Juan now serves as the finance manager for DAC Car Sales. And if you think he hasn't already done everything, he also has an independent company that imports coffee. So he's an independent distributor for that. So Juan is, brings a wealth of expertise to us. I also want to introduce Michael Allen. Michael works as the Director of Development at Friendship Bridge, which is a microfinance and international development NGO. Friendship Bridge used microfinance and education programs to build entrepreneurship and help Guatemalan women create a more sustainable future for themselves, their families, and communities. Michael joined Friendship Bridge in 2012, coming from the president's office at the University of Oklahoma in Tulsa. Um, Michael is an avid rock climber, and the rock climbing here is a whole lot better than the rock climbing in Tulsa. <laughs> he served as director of development at the University of Oklahoma, where he raised funds for capital improvements and important research and service projects, ranging from homeless youth medical outreach to free clinics for the underinsured. Before working at the university, now take a look at Michael. This is a young person, right? Before working at the university, Michael worked in professional politics as the press secretary for Congressman Dan Boren, and as a legislative aide to Congressman David Wu. Michael also recently served as an adjunct professor at the University of Oklahoma, teaching leadership in the College of Liberal Studies and serving on the board of directors for the Susan G. Komen Foundation in Tulsa. In addition to being an avid rock climber, ice climber, adventurist, and photographer, Michael has also known to, been known to do a little salsa dancing from time to time. So, President Jim, 
former president, Jim, it's with pleasure that I pre present to our Rotary Club two outstanding gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Can we get you to come up a little bit? There are about 1.25 million Rotarians in the world. There are about 33,000 clubs. Rotary reaches into 177 different countries in the world. The average Rotarian is probably not from the United States, probably from Asia, Africa. The average Rotarian is, pro Rotarian is probably a male today. Um, that's changing. The average Rotarian across the globe has reasonable, reasonably good means, but that changes depending on where you are in the world. There may not be much value in understanding an average Rotarian. A typical Rotarian, however, is a community leader. A typical Rotarian has a very high sense of ethics in the way they approach their daily life. And when they say the four-way test, they mean it, and they use it each day in their work. A typical Rotarian believes very strongly that service above self is how we make our communities grow, it's how we make our country better, and it's how we make our world better. And they do take service above self as a mantra personally. We're happy to have you both as a member of our club. We're happy because we think that you bring the same attributes of leadership and community sponsorship to Rotary that a typical Rotarian does. The easy part here today is to welcome you as a member of Rotary. And I know that Mark Donovan, who I think is a gift to this club and to you as your sponsor, I know that Mark has talked to you about how good Rotary how, how, how much Rotary will do for you. My challenge to you is the only person that can make you a Rotarian is you. And you can do that by stepping up now, learn the committees, pick one or two that's, that pull at your heartstring, get involved right now, and be a member of our club, and, and start contributing. And at some point after you begin this journey, we hope that you will see that the power of Rotary is that the leverage that Rotary brings each of us every day in our ability to serve a wider group of people, a wider part of the growth of the globe, and in order to just practice good ethics and good service every day of our lives. We thank you for starting your trip on Rotary here. I think part of the power of Rotary sits right out here. I, in, I invite you, I actually demand that you meet as many of these people as you can because they are the true strength of Rotary and they represent all that's good in the world. Would you all help me welcome our two newest members, Michael and Juan. I'd now like to invite, this is another fun fight, Harry Ellison, the 2013 Branch Ricky Award Chair, Lucius Ashby, our DRCF President, and Jared John, uh, Jackson, the Communication Officer with Denver Kids. We're going to do a little, a little recounting of how successful Branch Ricky was this year. Thank you, Jim. Uh, last November 16th, we held the 22nd Annual Branch Ricky Award banquet where we honored Clayton Kershaw of the Los Angeles Dodgers for his community service and our own Jerry Mitchell for an exceptional community service award. For those of you that attended, volunteered, and donated your time and money, I thank you very much and want you, everybody to give it a round of applause for all of you. <laughs> the purpose of the uh, banquet is to generate a revenue uh, donated to our uh, uh, foundation, and I'd like to review the results we had last year. There were 409 people attended. We generated $171,455 in gross revenue with expenses of $114,394, leaving a net of $57,061 that's given to the Rotary Club Foundation. And I do want to thank the major sponsors, AMG, National Trust Bank, and UMB Bank for uh, assisting us in putting on last year's event. Thanks, sir. As you know, I'm, I'm Lucius. 
and, and it is always a pleasure to have the opportunity to be up here and, and talk with you. <clears throat> and, and really, I appreciate your support of the Branch, branch Ricky and your continued, continued contributions to our foundation. You, you, your, your continued support and contributions to the foundations and the Branch Ricky continue to help us be, be what we are and, and, and help us um, have a better community. I want to emphasize that it's not just the Branch Ricky event that, that helped, pre helped present this check today to Denver kids, but, but it's with your continued financial support to the foundation that allows us to do this. Sometimes, I'm, I'm not sure, um, and I think, wh why do I continue to write these checks and why do I contribute? I, I used to be like that because that is what we do. We provide financial and personal involvement to those who are not as fortunate as us. We, we, we begin with making a dif difference in Denver and let it spread around the world. Branch Rickey is just one of the many things we do to demonstrate what we are about. We do not just talk the talk, we walk the walk. We live our vision of, of self, of service above self. This is what it really means to be a Rotarian, that these are our actions rather than just words. So that is why I, I am proud to be a Rotarian. And as you know, I, I have not always been a real Rotarian, for a while just a Rotarian in name. And, and now I can say I, I, I am a Rotarian because I, I, I understand that. So it's, so, it's with, so it's with pleasure and I'm happy to present this check to Denver Kids for $135,000. more money than I've ever had in my hand at once, so <laughs> this feels kind of cool. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just start out by thanking Harry um, and the Branch Ricky Committee for your leadership um, and for all the great things that you've done for our organization. There was a point in my life, believe it or not, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and, and I was, I was kind of struggling, and one day my mom, she, she told me a saying, and she said that the, that the day would come when the risk to remain tight in a bud would be more painful than the risk it took to bloom. And so that's something that's kind of stuck with me. And I think at Denver Kids, we believe in that exact same thing. We believe that the, that the risk and the pain associated with letting the dropout crisis happen around us is far too great for our community to bear. We know that the lesser risk is to risk failure while attempting to serve 5,000 students by the year 2020 and making a dent in the dropout crisis. We're proud to announce that this year, we've, we'll, we plan to grow by over 40% and add 425 new students to our roles. That's a big deal. We'll also hire nine new educational counselors to serve those students. And this money really helps to go through that. And all of this that we do would not be possible without you guys at Denver Rotary especially um, the support that you've given. You know, our relationship goes back to 1946, um, and in those years, you guys have given Denver kids well over a million dollars, and that goes a long way. But just like Denver kids doesn't look the same that we did 10 years ago, I'm sure Rotary doesn't look the same that it did 10 years ago, we won't look the same in 10 years that, that we look now. We want to grow, we want to serve more students, and I think that's a big opportunity for our relationship to grow even stronger. So with that, thank you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I, I really do want to point out, I hope you heard, 400 students, 400 more this year. And I think we're just as, as proud of you all as you are proud to be a part of ours. Thank you so much. Well, we've been looking forward to the program probably for a couple of weeks, if not longer, and it looks to be pretty spectacular. But to be truthful, opera has been a little bit of an enigma to me over the years, and so I turned to Jose Carreras, his notes, and he had a little list of things about opera, and he said, you're in trouble if you're a baritone in an Italian opera and you expect to get the girl. Now, there are more. They're going to get it, and we're going to learn. You're in trouble 
if you're a soprano in a romantic opera and you expect to live. <laughs> you're in trouble if you're a tenor in love with a mezzo, and that's in all but a handful of operas, and you expect a happy ending. You will end up in jail, dead or alone, ten to- nine times out of ten. And you're in trouble if you're a baritone married to a soprano and you expect her to be faithful to you. So on that note, I'd like to ask President-elect to Jim Goddard to introduce our program for the day. Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure for me to be here and introduce this program. You know, we've all been exposed to the students, uh, the opera students at CU uh, who come here every year. And I, I learned today a lot more about the process that an opera singer goes through to get to a point of uh, the highest level of performance. And so today we're going to be seeing that next level of performance, and uh, I'll let Greg tell all about that. But it's my pleasure to introduce Greg Carpenter, and I want to give just a little bit of background about him. He's actually just the fourth general director of Opera Colorado. He uh, guides both the artistic and the operational or administrative side of the business and uh, has been this dir- the director, general director since 2007. Previous to that, he was in a very important position, which was the fundraising arm of that organization since, um, from 2004 to 2007. Prior to joining Opera Colorado, he was with the National Symphony Orchestra at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. I think you'll see that... Um, it's, we're really lucky to have Greg in, in Denver here. From 86 till uh, 1998, Greg um, performed as a professional opera singer in uh, such places as the Glimmerglass Opera, Central City Opera, Sarasota Opera, Opera Theater of Northern Virginia, Cleveland Opera, and Lyric Opera of Cleveland. Uh, there are a couple of per- performers who aren't here today, and I asked him if maybe he was going to perform, but he decided that he would not. Um, someday we'd like to hear that, Greg. He is also, uh, or has served on the board of directors for Opera America. He currently serves in that position, the National Service Organization for the Opera Industry. In 2009, Greg received a Livingston Fellowship Award in Leadership from Bonfi Stanton Foundation. He also serves as a judge for auditions and competitions, and he received his master's, or sorry, his bachelor's degree in music in vocal performance at Wittenberg University, a Master of Music degree in vocal performance from Michigan State University, and he completed postgraduate studies at the University of Maryland School of Music. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Greg Carpenter. Thanks, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here to uh, talk very little about Opera Colorado, so we have plenty of time for the singers to perform for you, but also to say thank you to Rotary for the amazing work you do in our community. Um, It's organizations like this that make Denver a great place to live, so thank you. Um, Probably the most sexy or most visible side of Opera Colorado is what we do two blocks down the street here at the Ellie Calkins Opera House. Our major grand opera productions there. This season will be opening on March 15th with uh, Verdi's Rigoletto. You'll hear a piece from that today. And uh, in May, on May 3rd, we'll open with Carmen, which is probably one of the most popular operas of all time. Uh, even if you've not been to an opera, you will have heard something from Carmen in a commercial or in a movie, things like that. But that's sort of the glamorous, sexy side of Opera Colorado. Um, The side of Opera Colorado that is one of my favorites is what we do out in the community, not just what we do down here at the Opera House. Um, Each year, through our community and education programs, we serve over 37,000 students of all ages. About 27,000 of those students are K through 12, um, and the other 10 is typically adult education programs that we do. We go anywhere from uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming, all the way to the Western Slopes with these programs. At the heart of that are the Opera Colorado Young Artists. These are singers who have just, in most cases, just completed their master's degree in vocal performance, and they're trying to find that bridge, you might say, between the academic world and the professional world of opera. Um, Each year we get about 
500 applicants for five positions. Look at the odds there. Um, uh, we weed that down to about 150 people that we actually hear in an audition. They have eight minutes to show us what they can do. And from that eight minute audition, we select five lucky singers to be here between five and seven months out of the year. These singers are out in the community doing things like um, our tour shows of Romeo and Juliet and um, the, uh, excuse me, the Barber of Seville. Um, and then they have the extraordinary opportunity also to take part in our main stage operas. So if you come and see um, our productions of Rigoletto and Carmen, you will see them in some of the smaller roles and that valuable experience that they get out of standing next to some of the metropolitan stars that we have with us during the seasons and the, the exceptional experience of, of, of that mentorship between the people who have been out there in the business for years and these up and coming stars of the future is an amazing part, I think, of what we do here at Opera Colorado. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to have the Young Artists of Opera Colorado present a little program this afternoon with, shall we say, a little bit of a Valentine's Day theme. And at the end of that, you'll have about five minutes or so for some questions and answers with the team. Thank you. Good afternoon. This first piece is Caro Nome from Verdi's Rigoletto, and indeed, I am a soprano and I die at the end.
Good afternoon. My name is Jared Guest, and I am a baritone. And uh, as Jim mentioned earlier, we often get the shaft a lot of the times. Um, this next piece I will be singing is from uh, Donizetti's The Elixir of Love, and I will be singing Come Pari de Vezzoso. So my character, the baritone, as you can tell, uh, is named Belcore, and he is devilishly handsome and exceedingly, exceedingly arrogant. <laughs> and um, the, the show starts with uh, the, the simple but very passionate tenor being desperately in love with the well-educated and beautiful soprano. And what could stop this happy reunion uh, other than, of course, the baritone? <laughs> so Belcore comes onto the scene and um, sees how beautiful that uh, Adina is and um, realizes, well, I'm perfect and she's perfect, so clearly we're perfect together. And that's sort of the gist of this aria, come pari de vezzoso. Good afternoon, I am Benjamin Sieverding, and I am the bass, and I'm from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Now, the bass, you may have noticed, was not mentioned earlier, <laughs> because we are often not the love interest, we are often somebody's father or the villain of the piece. But today, I'm going to sing a popular tune from Swing Time called The Way You Look Tonight to show you that basses are indeed capable of great love.
and I realized I failed to introduce myself. I'm Colleen Jackson, by the way, the soprano young artist. Um, another dying soprano role, um, I'll be singing. <laughs> it happens all the time. Uh, Sempre Libra from uh, Verdi's La Traviata. Uh, this is a little bit of a different kind of love than all you experienced with Gilda. Um, Violetta's actually questioning whether she should go for love because it's something foreign to her and she's just now experiencing these new feelings and isn't quite sure how to approach them. So enjoy. And I believe this will be our last number for you today. Um, and you'll notice it is not from an opera, but from one of our beloved classic mu musical theater pieces, Cinderella by Rodgers and Hammerstein. This is uh, the point in the show where the prince, once again, <laughs> first sees Cinderella coming into the ball, walking down the staircase, and falls head over heels in love with her. This is 10 minutes ago. Thank you. 
Thank you, everyone. My name is Charity Kepke. I am the Director of Education and Community Engagement for Opera Colorado, and I'm also the lucky lady who gets to be the Director of the Opera Colorado Young Artists. It is the best job in the world. I want to give one more round of applause to someone who gets maybe not as much flash and bang applause as they do, but we couldn't do anything without him. Please give Taylor Baldwin a big round of applause. So we have time for just a few questions, but what I want to do first is just have them go down the line and tell you their names, where they're from, and where they got their degrees from as well. I'm Taylor Baldwin. I'm originally from Virginia. Um, I got bachelor's of, <laughs> of uh, music, piano performance from Radford University, and a master's in uh, orchestral conducting and collaborative piano from University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Once again, as if you could forget, my name is Jared Guest. <laughs> I'm the baritone young artist. I'm from Orlando, Florida. I did my bachelor's degree at the, uh, Florida State University, national champions. Um, my master's at the University of Houston Moore's Opera Center. Again, I am Colleen Jackson. I'm originally from Jacksonville, Florida. I also did my bachelor's of music um, in voice performance at Florida State University. And I had the pleasure of moving to Colorado about three and a half years ago. And I did my master's of music and voice performance at the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley. I'm Benjamin Sieverding, originally from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I did my undergraduate work at South Dakota State University in Brookings. And I did my master's work and subsequent postgraduate work at the University of Michigan. Go blue, not green, Greg. And I'm originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, I got my undergrad and my grad from the University of New Mexico, and I was with the Santa Fe Opera for about seven years before I was lucky enough to find a place with Opera Colorado, and I've been here for around seven years right now as well. So, questions. 
What do you want to know? We have time for two, okay. if that's all right. Yeah. Okay. How are the acoustics in here? Compared to what we get at schools when we're singing in cafeterias, it's great. <laughs> Anyone else have a question? question. The mission and purpose behind our education programs was the question. Our mission and purpose for education is enrolled in all of the mission of Upper Colorado. We believe that education is a component in everything that we do, and it's to educate and entertain and enrich the lives of our audiences in Colorado, regardless of their age. We believe that opera is a real conduit to true human emotion. And we, opera shows those emotions in such big ways, it often will connect with kids, especially when people aren't thinking that it's going to. Um, the two shows that we tour into schools are the Barber of Seville and Romeo and Juliet, like Greg said. And it's amazing to watch their responses. We even have little bitty preschoolers that will come and sit through a 45-minute performance without wiggling. That's saying something right there. So we really believe that opera is meant to teach people about the human condition, and it does it in such an amazing way. We're so proud that we can be a part of making that happen. This was magnificent. Would you all join me?